Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte. Chapter 20. The Farewell. A house in A. Blank, the fashionable watering place, was hired for our seminary, and a promise of two or three pupils was obtained to commence with. I returned to Horton Lodge about the middle of July, leaving my mother to conclude the bargain for the house, to obtain more pupils, to sell off the furniture of our old abode, and to fit out the new one. We often pity the poor, because they have no leisure to mourn their departed relatives, and necessity obliges them to labour through their severest afflictions. But is not active employment the best remedy for overwhelming sorrow, the surest antidote for despair? It may be a rough comforter, it may seem hard to be harassed with the cares of life, when we have no relish for its enjoyments, to be goaded to labour when the heart is ready to break, and the vexed spirit implores for the rest only to weep in silence, but is not labour better than the rest we covet, and are not those petty, tormenting cares less hurtful than a continual brooding over the great affliction that oppresses us? Besides, we cannot have cares and anxieties and toil without hope, if it be but the hope of fulfilling our joyless task, accomplishing some needful project, or escaping some further annoyance. At any rate, I was glad my mother had so much employment for every faculty of her action-loving frame. Our kind neighbours lamented that she, once so exalted in wealth, and station should be reduced to such extremity in her time of sorrow, but I am persuaded that she would have suffered thrice as much had she been left in the affluence, with liberty to remain in that house, the scene of her early happiness and late affliction, and no stern necessity to prevent her from incessantly brooding over and lamenting her bereavement. I will not dilate upon the feelings with which I left the old house, the well-known garden, the little village church, then doubly dear to me, because my father, who for thirty years had taught and prayed within its walls, lay slumbering now beneath its flags, and the old bare hills, delightful in their very desolation, with narrow vales between, smiling in green wood and sparkling water, the house where I was born, the scene of all my early associations, the place where throughout life my earthly affections had been centred, and left them to return no more. True, I was going back to Horton Lodge, where, amid many evils, one source of pleasure yet remained but it was pleasure mingled with excessive pain, and my stay, alas, was limited to six weeks. And even at that precious time, day after day slipped by, and I did not see him, except at church. I never saw him for a fortnight after my return. It seemed a long time to me, and as I was often out with my rambling pupil, of course, hopes would keep rising, and disappointments would ensue, and then I would say to my own heart, here is a convincing proof, if you would but have the sense to see it, or the candour to acknowledge it, that he does not care for you. If he only thought half as much about you as you do about him, he would have contrived to meet you many times ere this. You must know that, by consulting your own feelings. Therefore, have done with this nonsense. You have no ground for hope. Dismiss at once these hurtful thoughts and foolish wishes from your mind, and turn to your own duty and the dull blank life that lies before you. You might have known such happiness was not for you. But I saw him at last. He came suddenly upon me as I was crossing a field 
in returning from a visit to Nancy Brown, which I had taken the opportunity of paying while Matilda Murray was riding her matchless mare. He must have heard of the heavy loss I had sustained. He expressed no sympathy, offered no condolence, but almost the first words he uttered were, How is your mother? And this was no matter of course question, for I never told him that I had a mother. He must have learned the fact from others. If he knew it at all, and besides there was sincere goodwill, and even deep, touching, unobtrusive sympathy in the tone and manner of the inquiry. I thanked him with due civility, and told him she was as well as could be expected. What will she do? was the next question. Many would have deemed it an impertinent one, and given an invasive reply, but such an idea never entered my head, and I gave a brief but plain statement of my mother's plans and prospects. Then you will leave this place shortly, said he. Yes, in a month. He paused a minute, as if in thought. When he spoke again, I hoped it would be to express his concern at my departure, but it was only to say, I should think you will be willing enough to go. Yes, for some things, I replied. For some things only. I wonder what should make you regret it. I was annoyed at this, in some degree, because it embarrassed me. I had only one reason for regretting it, and that was a profound secret, which he had no business to trouble me about. Why, said I, why should you suppose that I dislike the place? You told me so yourself was the decisive reply. You said, at least, that you could not live contentedly without a friend, and that you had no friend here, and no possibility of making one, and, besides, I know you must dislike it. But if you remember rightly, I said, or meant to say, I could not live contentedly without a friend in the world. I was not so unreasonable as to require one always near me. I think I could be happy in a house full of enemies, if, but no, that sentence must not be continued. I paused, and hastily added, and besides, we cannot well leave a place where we have lived for two or three years without some feeling of regret. Will you regret to part with Miss Murray? your sole remaining pupil and companion? I dare say I shall, in some degree. It was not without sorrow I parted with her sister. 